is that folk music that you play there? What is that? How do you call that folk music? <laughs> I think it was Stud Circle who asked Big Bill Brunzi, did he consider his blues music to be folk music? And Big Bill says, well, uh, never heard, heard no horse. <laughs> <laughs> I could always find a reason why a guy was not my style. He was rude or crude or married or he didn't ever smile. But you are kind and charming and the model of restraint. Just what I was looking for and that is my complaint. Won't you please do something stupid so I can get over you? If you really cared about me, it's the least that you would do. The perfect man's not in my plans. I got too much to do. So won't you please do something stupid so I can get over you? At the dinner table, you did not show me your scar. You did not say you were in movies and I could be a star. You didn't show up with your toothbrush expecting you could stay. You never asked how old I was or how much I weighed. On the way to take me home, your car did not run out of gas. You did not stop to hawk some loogies off the overpass. Won't you please do something stupid so I can get over you? If you really cared about me, it's the least that you would do. The perfect man's not in my plans. I got too much to do. So won't you please do something stupid so I can get over you? It's always been so easy not to sweep me off my feet. I was happy with my Irish setter and my parakeet. Do you have to be so handsome? Do you have to be so sweet? I was sure I'd set my standards for someone I'd never meet. I never date comedians because they never laugh. Or anyone whose love letters are not at least a paragraph. Or someone else's boyfriend. Or anyone named Steve. Or anyone in high school, but you are none of these. Won't you please do something stupid so I can get over you? If you really cared about me, it's the least that you would do. The perfect man's not in my plans. I got too much to do, so won't you please do something stupid so I can get over you? All right, all right, all right. Thank you. The show is Horses Sing None of It. My name is Ralph Litwin, and our guest today is the professional smart aleck, Carla Ulbrich. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. So is that an autobiographical Well, yes, basis? Not, not a recent autobiography, because as you know, I moved up from South Carolina to New Jersey about seven years ago, because I did find the perfect man. So that's a past chapter, but still speaks to some people, so I still sing it. Uh, it's very different, New Jersey and South Carolina. Very, very different places. I've, I've found a lot of people don't, up here don't know much about South Carolina. Uh, my neighbor didn't even know there were two Carolinas. So I told him it was east and west. Uh, but I don't understand why people don't know anything about South Carolina. We have lots of famous people from there. Uh, Hootie and the Blowfish. Stephen Colbert, Vanna White. Vanna White. Vanna White, yes, she's from South Carolina. We're very proud of her because she can spell. <laughs> as long as the letters light up first. <clears throat> this brings us to what we're not known for, of course, in South Carolina, great public education. We're not usually in the top 10 states or even in the top 48. <laughs> Which brings us to our state motto, thank God for Alabama. 
Uh, but um, the one big thing, of course, you probably already know this, uh, the big thing that we're known for in South Carolina is we are where the Civil War started. It's still going, of course. <laughs> we're determined to finish the job, break off and form our own country, because you know what they say, if at first you don't succeed, try. Try, try, try. again. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Huh. Well, if you hated that, wait till you hear this. <laughs> In an orchard in California, when two oranges were combined, the strainers needless because they're seedless, and they call them clementines. I warned you. This one's even worse. I went for a bite to eat, a shape of tea, down the street. I ordered what I thought was exotic meat, and this is what I learned. Buffalo wings aren't made out of wings, made out of wings, made out of wings. Buffalo wings aren't made out of wings, and they're not made of buffalo. Finally, on the nth day of Xmas, my algebra teacher gave to me a second year in the same course. <laughs> I'm kind of limited, you know, I'm, if I'm going to do some parodies here because it's television, I, I, I don't want to do anything that's copywritten um, by someone else, by, by me, maybe, you know, but I, I do write a lot of parodies. I write a lot of my own songs, but I also write a lot of parodies, but I wanted to stick to things that I knew would be acceptable to play on television and then you wouldn't get people ringing you up and going, hey, you used my song. So um, those songs, I think Clementine's in the public domain by now though. I think so. <laughs> it was in my Mel Bay book when I was like nine, which was at least seven years ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> that book hasn't changed much. Um, so w would you like to hear my big hit? Sure. Okay, I, I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> I got something close though. I, I got the song that got me my first piece of hate mail. Not, not the only piece, just the first piece. Also on the topic of romance. I was just wondering, hypothetically, what would you do? Theoretically, if something should happen accidentally or medically, what if your girlfriend was gone? If she died in a fire from a broken light fixture or happened to swallow a poisonous mixture, would I find my way back into the picture if you were suddenly alone? Would you call me up? Would you write me a letter? Would you tie a message to your Irish setter? Try to get through so we could be together? What if your girlfriend was gone? Let me just stop right here, because I, <laughs> I can tell. Like, everybody's wondering, why isn't this song a huge hit? It's fantastic, and I too am baffled by this. But you're also thinking, you know, Carla, the key to success in the music business, and, and in life really, is persistence. So just keep singing that song and don't ever change a word of it. Well, I'm afraid you're too late. I've already rewritten the entire song. A parody of my own song, I got permission for myself. And uh, I wrote this when I was sick. Uh, I had you know, kidney failure and a bunch of other things, and I, and I lost a lot of weight. And then I went on a candida diet. Have you ever heard of candida diet? Yes. You have. Have you done it? No. It's really hard. You know why they call it the candida diet, right? Why? Because you can't eat a thing. <laughs> <laughs> no wheat, no dairy, no sugar, nothing with yeast, no beer, no chocolate, no reason to live, basically. And I got too thin. I'm all better now. But briefly, I was too thin. And I wrote this. I was just wondering. Hypothetically, what would you do? Theoretically, if something should happen accidentally or medically, what if your butt was gone? If sitting in a wooden chair felt like tax and you found you had nothing to hold up your slacks because instead of a butt, you just had a crack, something would have to be done. Would you write dear Abby for advice in a letter, put a cushion in your chair to make it feel better, try to fatten up with brie and cheddar, what if your butt's gone? If your butt disappeared without a trace and everyone looked all over the place, why do you have that look on your face? Okay, it could happen to you. If that booty patootie, that sweet derriere were now inexplicably no longer there, how soon would you miss it? How much would you care? What do you think you would do? Would you call me up? Would you fall to pieces? Would you make it the topic of your doctoral thesis? Try to go out and find a prosthesis. What if your butt was gone? They make them, you know. I saw one at Spencer's. A butt, as you know, could be curvy or flat, dimpled or pimpled, skinny or fat, just like an opinion. Everyone's got one, but what if your butt was suddenly not one if something should happen? Hypothetically, what would you do? 
theoretically, if something should happen accidentally or medically, what if your butt's gone? Would you call me up? Would you start confiding how you tried to make it grow with fluorescent lighting? How you had to give up horseback riding? What if your butt's gone? Would you realize there's a good selection? Shopping for clothes in the children's section. Go to your closet, make a commotion. Take all your pants and throw them in the ocean. Ooh, sing along, here we go. Does your butt hang low? Does it wobble to and fro? Can you tie it in a nut? Can you tie it in a bow? Can you sling it over your shoulder like a continental soldier? What if your butt was gone? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now that was one of your songs that was featured on Dr. Demento's show. It was. Actually, both of those were featured on Dr. Demento. Uh, he, about 10 years ago, started playing my music and took the, he does an annual Best of Dr. Demento CD, and uh -huh. he put What If Your Girlfriend Was Gone on that CD, and I was so excited. Yay, Dr. Demento. And then a few years later, he put What If Your Butt Was Gone <laughs> on the Best of Dr. Demento. And I was really excited until I thought about it, because there's only two songs of mine he's ever put on his Best of Dr. Demento CDs. What if your girlfriend was gone? And a parody of what if your girlfriend was gone? <laughs> Which actually got me to thinking. I was just wondering, hypothetically, what would you do? Theoretically, if literally, figuratively, even alphabetically, what if you only had one good song? <laughs> if the song that you wrote got a zillion requests and everyone said it was surely your best and they clapped for that one and then yawned at the rest, what if you only had one good song? Would you hang it up, put your writing on the shelf, learn some songs by somebody else, stoop to writing a parody of yourself? What if you only had one good song? <laughs> Thank you. So Carla, we should find out, we should let people find out how they can find out more about your recordings and your performance schedule. Absolutely, I'm online as is everybody. I'm CarlaU.com, C-A-R-L-A-U.com. I just gave up on the last name ever getting spelled right. That Maybe. was smart. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I bet you get misspellings of Litwin. It seems so simple, but I bet you get misspellings of it. Lipman, Lipman. Lip yeah. Lipton, you ever get Lipton tea? No. No, not yet. Not yet. I'll send you a card. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got so frustrated by it. My dad and I, we have the same last name. Kind of spooky, right? <laughs> and uh, we have competing collections of address labels to see who's got like the worst mangling of our last name. So we get like Vibrick, Albrecht, Ulbricht, Albright, Obrick, the Irish branch of the family. <laughs> and uh, I got the best one so far, though. I'm winning. I got a piece of mail for Clara Olprickle. <laughs> and I said, that that's the winner. That's it. I started the Difficult Last Name Club after that elected myself president and wrote myself this theme song. My name is Carla. It is not Darla. It is not Clara, Carol, Claire, Marla, or Starla. My middle initial is a K. It stands for K. But the first name is C-A-R-L-A. Carla Albrick, what's in a name? A name is a name is a name is a name is a name. As for the last name, here's the hitch. Looks like it should be pronounced Yulebrich, but we say Ulbrich, though there's no O in sight. If we were German, we would say it right. Kala Ulbrich, a German name. A rose that had my name would smell the same. I was in Borders at the bookstore. I have to explain that, because we don't have any in South Carolina, because we don't read. Where was I? I was in Borders, standing in line. A book of baby names caught my eye. Under Carla, it said C. Charles. I thought it was going to say C. Carl, because that's my dad's name and my granddad's. They tried for a boy on the closest one they had. Under Charles, almost uncanny. Charles's definition is manly. Carla Albrick, a manly name. A man is only as good as her name. My great-great-grandmother 
she was Deutsch. She fell in love with a stable boy. They had a baby, it was a cute one. But the stable boy's last name was Von Pfennekuchen. How do you spell that? For heaven's sake. Translated, it means pancake. Carla Pancake, that I could see. Pancakes are short and sweet, just like me. I'm singing a song about my name. You must think that I am really vain, but I'm not the first one to have such a song. Bingo had one and he was just a dog. C-A-R-L-A, 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 and Carla was her name. Thank you. You know, I played, played that at an outdoor festival and someone was offended because I said Bingo was just a dog. <laughs> so easy to offend people now, isn't it? It can be. <laughs> You're also an author. I am an author, yes. That is my book. And it's called How Can You Not Laugh at a Time Like This? And it's a collection of humorous essays about dealing with illness and even harder, dealing with the US healthcare system. <laughs> If you can survive the U.S. healthcare system, you can survive anything. Um, would you like to hear a top ten list out of that? Sure. Okay, I, this one's easy enough. This is called Top Ten Annoying Things to Say to Someone Who's Just Been Diagnosed. Nobody plans to walk into someone's hospital room and blurt out insensitive, inappropriate comments, and yet it happens all the time. <laughs> inappropriate comments when silence isn't awkward enough. Number ten. I knew someone who had that. She died. Great, thanks for the boost of confidence. <laughs> Number nine, I know someone who has that. He's in perfect health. How can you be in perfect health if you have a diagnosis of a serious illness? Number eight, is that a form of cancer? Why don't you look it up? Number seven, is that a form of AIDS? Why don't you look it up? Number six, and I got both of these on the same day. God is punishing you because you have a hidden sin in your life and the devil's attacking you because you are doing God's work. <laughs> Why don't you two get together before you come over and sort this out? Number five, I'm sure it's nothing, you'll be fine. Great, I'll cancel all my appointments. Number four, is it genetic? If you're not my twin, why does that matter? Number three, have you tried, insert crazy idea here. <laughs> Number two, you don't look sick. You don't look insensitive. <laughs> I guess appearances can be deceiving. And the number one annoying reaction to a diagnosis of serious illness. Is it contagious? <laughs> yes, and you can't leave until I lick your face. <laughs> <laughs> a little sampling from the book there. It's a very amusing book. Thank you. I guess you've heard some of those too. Well, I think we've all heard some inappropriate comments uh, at, at difficult times in our lives. So. Um, just about everybody can relate to being on one side of that equation or the other. I, I think I've said some stupid things myself. And you know, it leaves you being afraid to say anything. A lot of people just avoid coming to see you at all, even if you have the flu or anything. They're, they're just like afraid they're going to say something stupid. They don't know what to do. So um, I, I thought I was being helpful by writing that. And then some people are like, oh, no, I don't know what to say. <laughs> so um, I don't want to scare people off to not visit people. But um, it left me uh, them feeling like I must have felt when I would share the stage with some of these wonderful other folk musicians, but some of them, as you know, only sing serious songs. And they're beautiful, wonderful songs. And I start to feel a little self-conscious about being the strange person in the equation, especially when they have those shows where there's three or four in the round, you know, uh -huh. three or four artists, and we all take turns going. And then, um, so it'll be like a song about saving the planet, song about how much they love their spouse, and then a song about my butt. I don't know. The segue can be <laughs> a little awkward. So since I started feeling self-conscious about writing ridiculous songs, the only real solution was to write a self-conscious ridiculous song about feeling self-conscious about writing ridiculous songs. <laughs> it's kind of a homeopathic solution, actually. I sat and listened to each story. Deep, profound, evocatory. Courageous men who risked their lives 
love songs written for their wives. And then it was my turn. I took my lyric sheet outside to burn. Cause I had nothing to say. Nothing, 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 nothing to say. Nothing, 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 nothing to say. At home I was a poet. I treasured every line. Now that I am singing, I wish this song wasn't mine. Cause I have nothing to say. I consulted all the rule books. My structure was intact. I used my dictionary. My rhymes were all exact. I had written something clever. I had written something smart. But everyone before me had just broken every single heart. I had nothing to say. Nothing, 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 nothing to say. At home I was hilarious. I laughed at every page. Now I think it's funny or that they let me on a stage. Cause I have nothing to say. So I tried to be more serious and get outside my head. But everything worth saying. Already been said. See? My playing is not bursting with originality. I am not the first guitar player to play C, G, and D. I must have nothing to say. Nothing, 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 nothing to say. Nothing, 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 nothing to say. At home I was Ted Atkins with masterful technique. Seemed like such a great idea when I played it for my dad last week. Now I have nothing to say. I do not save the planet, not even just one tree. I don't stop abuse of children, or even those abusing me. My songs won't work in churches, not even at a peace rally. I must have nothing to say. Nothing, 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 nothing to say. Nothing, 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 nothing to say. At home I was a genius, now my songs all sound the same. When they introduced me, I wish they'd use a different name, cause I have nothing to say. Nothing, 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 nothing to say. Zero, zippo, nada, zilcho, nothing to say. Three chords and an easy rhythm, doesn't take much style or wit. I gotta go to Nashville, I think I finally have a hit, cause I have nothing to say. You are one of a kind, Carla. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little stab at Nashville. Well, I think we just have time to take it out. We can plug your website one more time. Carla U at? Carla U dot com. C-A-R-L-A U dot com. And uh, for more information about your recordings and your tour thing. dates, bio, lyrics, Yes. Okay. So um, one more song, or are we going to play yeah. this one together? Yeah. All right. Great. One of the things I really missed moving up here is the complete lack of Waffle Houses in New Jersey. None. What a bummer. It is a bummer. Where do you go after the gig? There's nowhere to go. So um, there's like three at every exit down south. I think it's the law, actually. You know I got offered a gig at Waffle House once? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it was a gig. They, they said it was pay a gig. You but in waffles? <laughs> they were. They're going to pay me in tips and waffles. I turned it down. But I did take the job at the nudist festival. Yeah, um, definitely a place that helps to imagine the audience in their underwear. <laughs> but no, I did not take the Waffle House gig. No. And you ever notice like, it doesn't matter how many Waffle Houses they put up, there, there's always one letter burned out in every sign. I decided that called for a song. This song, in fact. The guy who changes the light bulbs changes everything. He makes things as they once were. Security he brings. He's got power. He brings meaning. He sheds light on things. The guy who changes the light bulbs changes everything. See, Waffle 
Apple House is Awful House without a W. And why you might agree with that, you'd fix it if it were you. And here's another problem for which there's no excuse. No H, no O. I don't know, what is waffle use? The guy who changes the light bulb changes everything. When the guy at the Ramada has a boss who's a tight wad, we're left with Ram or Ada, sometimes Ahmad, or Da, which is yes in Russia, or perhaps the sun god, Ra. Sometimes they just am. Sometimes mad is all they are. How about some French cuisine, you might ask your spouse, when up ahead you clearly see a sign that says, Le House. <laughs> and whatever may befall me, may I never sink so low as to have to give it up for food and become a waffle hoe. <laughs> the guy who changes the light bulb changes everything. Does the guy who every morning delivers your newspaper, the one who cleans the bathroom and refills the toilet paper, the priest who sits and listens to the sins of the confessor, I just don't know where I'd be without my hairdresser. If you're feeling unimportant, like you might as well go fishing. Think back on those highway signs and seven letters missing. Because the guy who changes the light bulb says a most important job. When he's missing, how we miss him? Things get really odd. He's got power, he brings meaning, he's practically a god. The guy who changes the light bulbs is the most